and it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Steve Harrison. Now, Steve once told me in, a, in an amused way that when he gave a talk at the LMB, the way he was introduced was, Steve spent a year here at the lab a, a, a few decades ago, and he'll tell us what he's been doing since. <laughs> and, and this has a slightly, you know, fog in the channel, continent cut off quality. <laughs> so um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Steve. Steve got his um, undergraduate degree at Harvard in physics and chemistry and joined the biophysics program and decided he wanted to spend a year away doing something else. And again, in one of those engineer decisions, uh, came to the LMB for, uh, to spend a year with Aaron. And I believe you got interested in viruses uh, as a result of that uh, year. He went back and worked with Don Casper, who had also worked with Aaron on uh, you know, organization of viruses. And then he went on to uh, crystallize and solve the first structure of an icosahedral uh, virus. And you have to remember, it was at a time when there were no synchrotrons. Uh, computers had, I think, about 16 or 32K of memory. And, uh, you know, you had to analyze uh, millions of reflections. And, you know, he had made an important connection here at the LMB with Gerard Bricon, uh, who helped uh, with many of the computing uh, problems. And uh, as a result, he went on to become uh, and continues to be one of the foremost structural virologists, uh, in, in, you know, in, in the field. But his interests encompass much more than virology. He's made contributions to signaling, to HIV components, to DNA uh, binding proteins, and more recently to the kinetochore complex. So, Steve. Well, thank, thank you very much. Uh, can I be heard? Uh, and what do I do to get the uh, slides on? Oh. Probably should have had an instruction and I didn't, so that's not good. <laughs> So we go up to the top. So sorry about this. Uh, let's see. Let me escape for a minute to get it started at the top rather than at the bottom. Okay, and I will explain this title in just a minute. Indeed, you've seen some eyes. Um, but uh, I'd like to begin uh, not only by expressing great privilege and gratitude for being here, one of the handful of outsiders, so to speak, to, to be honored to, to speak here today, <clears throat> but, but also to begin with a, a quote from Aaron, uh, let's see what I do to advance. Uh, <clears> there <throat> was actually quoted in the New York Times obituary, which, are, which is where I first found it, and it's actually on online there. Almost everything I've worked on, said Aaron, uh, after the I started, other people moved in and did all sorts of useful work. <laughs> he told the New York Foundation. But by then, I'd moved on to something else because people jump in when they see something good and spoil the fun, really. <laughs> Uh, and I've taken that as, as something of a, uh, a mantra, although I can't possibly live up to what Aaron did, because indeed, each of the things he moved on to created both a new field, a platform for all of the rest of us to do useful work, um, but also created yet another pillar of the edifice of structural biology, especially structural biology as applied to large subcellular assemblies that we've been hearing um, already in all of the uh, retrospective talks uh, that have preceded this one. So um, 
when I came uh, in 1964, uh, then uh, the LMB, of course, looked like that, uh, a kind of uh, castle on a hill, but uh, in, in an otherwise rather uh, empty landscape. Aaron's office was cluttered with uh, icosahedra, as you've heard. Uh, and here, actually, in 1962, it's about the only picture I could find from Ken Holmes's biography, um, a picture of Aaron in Boston in Don Casper's office with Ken and Don, uh, probably en route to the Cold Spring Harbor meeting in, in 1962. But at any rate, by uh, six years later, uh, he had shed some of that uh, bar mitzvah boy looking uh, 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 appearance that you saw in the film from the, in the picture from Madrid. But there's still this quizzical look that remained always on Aaron's face and that was always so inspiring. Um, so in explaining the title, um, I'll mention that what Aaron was working on as I arrived was uh, the work that you've heard lots about in, in, in trying to understand the um, structure of spherical viruses, and in particular, the work on, on the papilloma and, and polyoma viruses, including human wart virus. Uh, but one thing that um, Aaron, I remember quite vividly explaining to me was that it was useful to describe those images in ways in which you could remember them. And so that a lot of the images he called eyes, or there was uh, the, the one that you saw with three eyes in the middle was a threefold terraced view. I think, and um, and the notion that the terminology and in particular ways of of looking directly at something, and you heard Aaron say all that that Aaron's eyes really mattered, and that that looking directly at data and not at elaborate computer processed versions of those data was critically important to having good new ideas and not simply doing what was already clearly possible and worked out. That made a huge impression on me. Um, uh, one of them was called Owl's Eyes, incidentally, and that's the guy in the lower right where uh, you can almost see the beak uh, and the, the sort of owl looking a little bit uh, gruffly toward me. In any case, um, but the, 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 the importance of, of terminology and, and how it reflected epistemology is something that you, you've heard um, in many of the other. Oh. Oh. So anyhow, what I thought I'd do is actually jump to some of our own current useful work in Aaron's ter uh, terms in structural virology and trying to use it to add a fourth dimension. Aaron had added the third dimension to electron microscopy, added a fourth dimension to this kind of structural biology, and in particular our efforts literally right now, because it's hard for me to give a talk without trying to include something unpublished, uh, on how non-enveloped viruses, that is those without a membrane, so unlike sars coronavirus 2 but like the papillomaviruses, uh, uh, introduce a lesion in a membrane to get into, uh, to get into a set. Uh, and that, in a way, took off from my own work with Aaron and with Don Casper, um, this is the last paragraph of that Casper and Krug paper. And they said, whereas in an icosahedral shell, the nucleic acid might be released or expelled without a disassembly of the particle. And indeed that you could say, well, gee, that's true. And we already know that. And why are you working on this? Since um, the famous micrographs of T4 phage should show indeed that it uh, is quite receiving all the time. Uh, anyhow, I'll see whether I can make it happen more readily, um, I, the, the, that we now understand uh, quite a lot about. And actually, likewise, with some eukaryotic viruses as a result of, this is some very recent work uh, by CryoEM, uh, which showed that KLOC viruses actually, uh, in response to receptor binding and low pH, seem to create their own little channel for injecting their single strand RNA. But there are lots of viruses that uh, don't do things this way. Adenoviruses, rotaviruses, the polyomaviruses, for, uh, indeed, don't do things this way. They actually deliver essentially the whole particle or a modified particle into the cell. And it's that kind of problem that we're trying to work on. Uh, do we have a battery problem here? Or 
Well, what, I'll tell you what, instead of worrying about it, I'm just going to come around here since I know what's on the slide and try to do it, try to advance it. So rotaviruses um, are double strand RNA viruses with actually 11 uh, segments of double strand RNA uh, as a multipartite genome, all packaged into the particle you see in the uh, upper center. Uh, let's see if this thing, yes. That doesn't work there. So, anyway, don't worry. Uh, in fact, maybe the pointer will uh, activate and it doesn't seem to either. Don't worry, I can just describe. So that um, uh, this, this so-called triple layered particle is in fact the infectious virus particle. And the job of that outer layer made of two proteins, they're called VP4 and VP7, but I will call them the red protein and the yellow protein, uh, is simply to get the rest of the particle, this double layered particle, in, that's the payload into the cell. And that actually never disassembles further. It's got a polymerase and a capping enzyme inside, and it simply emits capped messenger RNA uh, in the cytosol. So you can just think of it as an honorary nucleus putting out capped message for ribosomes and the rest of the cellular machinery to uh, make more viral proteins with. Uh, but uh, it's this sequence at the bottom, which I'm, you will see several times, that is, is really what we're trying to understand and, and uh, that I will try to illustrate simply as a kind of projection into 2022 and beyond what I think Aaron had um, accomplished in uh, creating a platform uh, that we can call structural virology. And that's vi been vitally important for that matter for the vaccines uh, that all of you have taken both for the current circulating coronavirus, but also for flu and, and, and so on. And much of the current work is really motivated by the fact that we know structures and therefore that Aaron actually did what he did. So um, rotavirus also happens to have a nice little connection to the developments that Richard described because it was the um, sample, because of a collaboration we had had, that uh, uh, Nico Gregoriev used to uh, show that indeed adding up uh, uh, or aligning appropriately uh, the uh, components of a, or the frames of a um, cryo-EM movie that uh, Richard told us about because of the new detectors um, uh, led to unblurring, so to speak, because you could compensate for whatever specimen motion had been occurring during the exposure. So anyhow, the advantage for the kind of cell biology that one would like to do with these structures um, of these double-stranded RNA viruses is that you can actually take off that outer layer, the yellow and red layer, uh, do things to the particle uh, and to the, uh, and then add back recombinant proteins. And in particular, in the case I'll show you, uh, label both the core and the recombinant proteins with distinct fluorophores and be able to watch what's happening. And it's basically the advent of really sophisticated live cell fluorescent microscopy that's enabled one together with these structures to begin to think about how do we actually add the dimension of time in addition to the three dimensions that uh, we've had now for a while. And so in this particular movie, and this is with a spinning disc a confocal micro microscope, so a bit old fashioned by now, uh, you could see that this double layered particle where VP7 was red and the double layered particle inside was, was green, that um, I can perhaps pop back once. Uh, you can see this event during uh, infection of the cell in which uh, the double layer particle is actually released. And with the lattice light sheet microscopes that uh, uh, Eric Betzig has introduced, uh, we can now, and this is a movie from yesterday, um, uh, and the credits down there, it's all due to Tom Kirschhausen and, and an extraordinary imaging uh, laboratory he's built up. Uh, one can actually do this with far more sophisticated technologies in three dimensions in the cell. In this particular case, that trace you see with the arrows where the, the virus particle is sort of jittering around on the cell surface, it uh, suddenly um, 
uh, penetrates and this trace ends well before or the, the track ends before the end of the movie because that's when the double layer particle got released. This was just labeling at the outside. In any case, um, that's to suggest that one can actually move forward with this in ways that I think together with cryotomography will allow us to solve this problem properly. Here's the sort of time scale that um, everything's done in about 20 minutes or so. Um, and it was from these kinds of experiments where the virus binds, you may see it skate around on the cell surface for a few seconds or even up to a minute, but then um, it's relatively immobile. Uh, and within four or five minutes, it's actually protected from elution by EDTA, which takes off because of calcium stabilization, that outer layer, um, but hasn't yet uncoated. And then there's another three to five minutes uh, in which that uncoating process or the release of that inner particle occurs. And so it's, it's all done in, 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 in a relatively short time. Uh, and indeed, uh, transcription occurs uh, not too long afterwards. Now, let me quickly turn to the high resolution picture of the subunit simply to say that the, that the whole goal now is to actually turn that movie via cryo-EM and the crystal structures of these proteins that we had into um, an actual experimentally derived, data-derived molecular movie, not a sort of imagined sequence of things. And we're not there yet. And I think it's going to take another decade or two, probably I'll never be there to finish it off. But uh, in order to do that, but the real goal is to be able to do this not as some kind of simulation with cartoon um, uh, the Disneyland type um, uh, movies, but actually picture what's what's up. And there was, there was comparable dream with electrons in 1970, and we're there. So at any rate, um, the spike protein, the red protein BP4, is a trimer, but with this rather odd asymmetric organization of the top. And BP7 is a calcium stabilized trimer that therefore, when exposed to a low calcium environment, dissociates and the, that entire outer layer uh, falls off. We had also found that well, Phil Dormitzer, who then went on to much better things than rotavirus, he is actually the person who was in charge of the Pfizer uh, BioNTech vaccine development. Um, and so lots of us owe a lot more to him than his humble beginnings with us on, on, on uh, an enterovirus that's isolated from diarrheic stool. But at any rate, um, uh, from there to, to great things like public health uh, and important vaccines. But at any rate, he had managed to find that a, a, a large fragment of this protein uh, crystallized, but crystallized in a form that looked nothing like the cryoEM uh, derived spike that, that I've shown, and it suggested that this is a bit like the fusion proteins of flu, or for that matter, SARS coronavirus too that um, undergo a kind of reversal, a, 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 a turning inside out as part of the mechanism by which they elicit fusion of two membranes, or in this case, we assumed perforation in some way of the membrane that the, uh, that the particle uh, is contained in. Um, but uh, we couldn't relate that in any clear way, although we had all kinds of ideas, to that sequence that I, of events that I suggested until an accidental observation, again, using the eyeball, uh, that Simon Yaney made a few years ago when looking at a human rotavirus strain rather um, as a favor to a well-known uh, rotavirologist named Harry Greenberg to figure out where an antibody he was particularly interested in might buy. Um, and what with that human vaccine strain, a candidate vaccine strain that, um, that we had from the CDC, uh, to, uh, Simon noticed that the spike images were completely blurred and looked like they had two components, just looking at the 3D reconstruction, one that might be sort of like this, but the other one um, uh, looking like a threefold object that once we sorted it out was exactly the state 
we had seen in the, in the dormants or crystal structures. And so that showed that this reversal event occurs indeed on the virion surface, and that that step therefore uh, must have something to do with the sequence of events we had, we had talked about. Indeed, in this case, it wasn't a fragment, it was the intact protein. And there was a whole bit that was hanging out that we uh, had to hypothesize went into membranes. And indeed, that connected with earlier uh, work from the time we had done those uh, first uh, live cell imaging movies showing um, both bound and uh, um, early invaginating structures by cryotomography with Manny de Castro, uh, where an attachment that would be the full length of the spike we had seen it um, seemed to shorten. And indeed, now that we knew what to do, uh, we found, or Simon found a few particles to do a full icosahedral average because they were sufficiently engulfed that most of it was either the long or the short connection. And indeed, that um, fit very well with the kind of low resolution, with the kind of image we had seen. And you'll see that what we're doing right now with Nico Gregoria is trying to do contemporary cryotomography of fib milled sections or at the very thin edge of suitably fried egg spread out cells uh, to actually look at the uptake and release. And we begin to think we're getting there, though that is an N of one in the, on the right-hand side. But um, that, if you wish, is our fantasy for uh, what the release might look like, the internal release. Um, in any case, one was far too impatient to wait for all that. And uh, Toby Herrmann, uh, uh, who recently finished his graduate student, uh, found that he could get, get images like this with liposomes and viral uh, infectious viral virus particles. Um, and by then doing appropriate subclassification of the, of, of the um, spike structures. And so if we're looking down there um, because of just the nature of the area, most of the, uh, 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 the class that is, is relevant is rather near where the, the membrane peels away from the, um, the particle. Uh, one could actually see, and especially with sort of lower contour stuff, that indeed something's jamming through the membrane. And if you look the other way, um, you can clearly see that indeed uh, that's exactly the dormage structure there, and it ends just where stuff needs to jam into the, into the membrane. And we now have, um, we hope, some tricks to be able to do this in a way in which we reconstitute trimers into membranes so we can see this at high resolution. Um, but that's to come. At any rate, our current model um, now looks like uh, this, where one has this reversal, and indeed we had engineered uh, a, a putative intermediate, it may not, not, not really be that, by locking the foot in place with a disulfide, and we could see that the top can rearrange appropriately, uh, and that um, therefore in the sequence of events I've uh, shown you, I can now sort of narrate that there's an attachment step, an engulfment step, that in the cells we've been using doesn't involve any of the standard clathrin or dynamic dependent machinery. It appears to be sort of a wrapping up of the virus itself, although I'd imagine the pinching off is an actin mediated thing, but probably not a particularly specific one. But there are other cell types in which there are clear images that the uptake can be through a clathrin coated vesicle as well. Since the clathrin uncoats immediately, whether the uptake is that route or a sort of auto-generated route, the end product within about half a minute is the same, a naked vesicle with the virus inside, a single naked vesicle with the virus, a single virus inside. And indeed, all of those uptake events, productive uptake events, are ones that occur as single viruses from a com compartment that has just a single virus in it. Uh, and uh, so we have asked, well, gee, given the state that we've just seen, what does that correspond to? And it turns out from some single um, part, uh, liposome experiments in vitro that we've just done, that Marilina de Sautu has just done, um, that, that uh, it corresponds basically to a calcium leak. And 
whether um, the what we've seen in the membrane is actually a calcium channel or just something that gives a nonspecific leak, we hope to work out. Uh, but in any case, what I we now need to understand as a result of that, that whole outer layer will dissociate so that the VP4 stuck in the membrane can now move around and make some larger perforation. And that's what we actually don't know, although we can jump forward and know that transcription occurs quite quickly. Um, within another 15 minutes, we can detect by RNA fish uh, some products. At any rate, um, this is, I didn't expect you to follow the experimental logic here or even get very excited about a virus that after all largely causes the runs in small kids, although for those of you with tiny children or who have had them, then um, you'll know that it's a bit of a nuisance. Um, but in any case, um, I, I hope that it, this will give you the sense that based on all the kinds of things we've heard up till now, in this symposium, that there's some hope of even moving forward beyond where we are now toward experimental data-derived molecular movies, especially by combining the kind of marvelous uh, advances in live cell imaging that Tom Kershazen's laboratory has done such a great job of assembling and making available collaboratively uh, with us, um, and the image analysis methods that go with that together with single molecule biophysics in, in um, both in vitro and, in, and in, in single molecule sensitivity in cells, that we can combine that with all the spectacular things that you've just heard from uh, Richard and others. And even, I believe, the advances in cryomicroscopy will feed back to what we need to dissect out as important crystal structures as well, and therefore the future of, of uh, X-ray crystallography is a key component of all this together with computational integration. So I hope then I've um, convinced you that uh, not only we, but the field has gone on in this one area that Aaron pioneered to do useful work, uh, very useful if you credit it with the structure and indeed structure informed vaccine designs that went into the Moderna and um, BioNTech uh, uh, vectors or RNA selections. Uh, and that um, I should then just thank uh, various people uh, who are either have been or are currently the two red names uh, in my own laboratory and, and uh, collaborations with Tommy's laboratory with Daniela Anikastro, with Yamini Krishnan, uh, who's a chemical biologist, made a calcium sensor for us. And uh, especially Nico Gregoriev, who's uh, been a long-term collaborator and really has facilitated the fact that we could move from X-rays to electrons uh, fairly smoothly. And so with that also, let me acknowledge really not only Aaron's uh, uh, influence because the year I spent here was utterly critical in shaping my own intellectual course. But of course, Don Kaspar, who, with whom I then uh, did my um, uh, PhD work, and Ken Holmes. Uh, so the, the trio in that, in that slide, Ken gave us after all synchrotron radiation, if you wish, or made it useful for us. Uh, uh, that trio, I think, is, is um, a, a special legacy of this place and, and one that I'm happy to feel a child or grandchild of. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Steve, for a really fascinating talk. Um, are there questions? I guess we we have had not had a single question in the uh, entire yeah. session. So it's really- and, and right, suppose, right now, a question would stand between us and lunch. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I guess it's really more of a, a retrospective, but it's really, really interesting to hear about uh, both your early work and uh, how it's transformed into this recent work on um, viral entry.